Today we got Saints Row the Third, released on November 15th, 2011. Quite the gap between this installment and the last one, and I remember sitting in my room waiting for this to drop. And when it did, I finally had the chance to watch somebody else play it on YouTube. Alas, I was not old enough to have a job, so I was broke. Granted, I was also not old enough to play this game in the first place, but I had a plan. Since my mother refused to purchase Saints Row 2 in person, I knew I had to switch it up. So I got her permission to use her card and got Saints Row 3 on eBay. Genius move by yours truly. <laughs> My future kids are never going to get away with that type of shit. Now Saints Row 3, I'm going to call it Saints Row 3 from now on, was remastered during the year of the rat. I'll be using this version so my eyes won't bleed as much. And since I already talked about the GTA clone accusations in the last video, there's not much else to bring up in the intro, so let's get into the story. Saints Row 3 begins with a Star Wars crawl. Yes, I'm aware that Flash Gordon did it first, but Star Wars made it popular. Just like how Grand Theft Auto wasn't the first- you, you know what? Never mind. To sum it up, basically the Saints are now pop culture icons. It's exemplified by this energy drink commercial. Here we see Pierce getting his ass kicked by a group of they thems until he gets a Zenkai boost and fights back. And when I saw him hit the last dude with a fire blast during my first playthrough, well, when I watched the walkthrough online, I said to myself, huh. This is a little wacky. Is this how it's going to be for the rest of the game? Don't worry, we'll get our answers soon enough. Then it zooms out and this new guy, Josh Burke, is watching the ad on his phone. He's hanging with the Saints because he's going to be playing one in a movie, you know, method acting. Johnny Gat and Shondi are getting ready to rob a bank. Then the boss shows up with a full costume on and a voice changer, which I understand as we will enter the character creation suite after this mission. Until then, the gender of the player will be ambiguous, and they did that because, I don't know. But I'm not not sure why the other guys got to do it too. Like the bank rob ease? Yeah, the bank robbies know it's them. I would say it's part of the immersion, but they're taking photos with the boss. That's how routine this is for them. Well, until the tellers start pulling their guns out. Turns out that this bank is run by the Syndicate, a criminal organization based outside of Stillwater. We shoot our way through the building until we reach the upstairs room. This is still a heist after all. Apparently, the plan was to take the whole vault with us by hooking it up to a helicopter. When we plant the C4, Burke accidentally sets off the alarm because he's an idiot. Although, I thought the explosion explosion itself would trigger a police response. Josh, are you trying to get us all jail time? What? I don't want to be some dude's bitch. What the hell is up with his face? Anyways, after clearing out the SWAT team, the boss decides to hop on top of the vault while the helicopter is trying to hoist it away. One of the officers says that Troy can't help you this time, which is funny because he doesn't even make an appearance in this game. When the helicopter inevitably crashes, the boss makes it back onto the roof, and also into the loving arms of the law. But at least we're now able to customize our character. It's quite detailed, so I give it that. Even as a person wait, who spends little wait, time on the face wait, sculpting wait, because I can wait, never get it to look wait, like wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. What the hell is that? You can run suicides in that forehead. How is it larger than mine? What the hell? What happened? We got arrested. No, to us. Burke's right. We traded our dicks in for pussies. Seriously. Movie deals, commercials. Saint's name used to mean something more than body spray and some ass tasting energy drink. You know what? Johnny is right. Never in a million years would I have thought that the Third Street Saints would be running around doing semi-staged bank robberies in Gat suits. Most of that weird shit was usually kept in the activities. But before Gat could even try to fix what's left of the series, they were interrupted by a new gang, the Morningstar, led by, or lieutenanted by, Viola and Kiki. Their real leader is Philippe Loren. He is also the leader of the Syndicate, the umbrella over the effort mentioned Morningstar, Deckers, and the Luchadors. We'll get to them later. But for now, we have to watch how Shondi, Gat, and the boss will escape this predicament. On a plane flying over the new city, we watch the twins give a PowerPoint presentation on why the Saints should work with the Syndicate. They propose a 66-34 revenue split. Of course, we decline the offer, which means that this gang is going to- wait, why does this all sound familiar? So what's the offer? 2080. I'm assuming I get the 80? Yeah, sure you do. This is either a callback or Volition is recycling a plot point within the first 20 minutes of the story. Either way, the business deal fell through, but before they get a chance to kill us, Gat breaks the screws out of his chair and starts throwing hands. Very cool, but why are there three chairs bolted in the center of this room? We're on a plane. It seems like a very odd design choice. What's even weirder is how weak the boss looks in a scene. I know it's supposed to show how badass Johnny is, and also the game devs want us to use the reworked unarmed combat system 
system, but at least have her clothesline somebody. Johnny tells Shondi and the boss to go kick rocks while he takes on the rest of the enemies by himself. At least this time we can prove that we can actually fight. Once we make it to the end of the plane, we grab the parachute and get ready to jump. When Shondi checks in on Johnny, Right on. I'll see you in still. Johnny? Johnny Gat is now dead. I'm being completely serious. That is his death scene. What a disappointing way to go out. Imagine if I told you that Gat dies in this game and you had no knowledge of what just happened. And then I asked you, how do you think they killed him off? Maybe he goes out like Zack Fair in the only Final Fantasy game I'll ever play, or like Emil in Halo Reach, or how about a great idea I just thought of that fits in this scene perfectly. After we help out the airplane, have it explode. I just spitballed all these suggestions and they're infinitely better than what we got, but instead... Now I really want to explain how asinine this is, but I'm gonna hold it until the critiquing section. All I'm going to say is that Johnny Gat is definitely dead, okay? And the boss seems to be taking it well. I don't know, I guess I was expecting a frown at least. Your best friend just died and you're making the, did I remember to turn the stove off face? The remaining higher ups of the saints, all two of them, end up falling out, but Shondi is without a parachute. This will be the first time in this game where you have to save her. While skydiving, you can see what Stillport looks like. Pretty clever move, Volition. It's a shame that it's a massive fucking downgrade from Stillwater. Once we save Shondi, we throw her back into the air because something cool needs to happen. I know the boss claims that the airplane is gonna crash into them, but they could just move out the way with those handles on the parachute. So after Shondi and the boss finally land on Stillport, we cut to Loren talking with the other members of the syndicate. Kilbane is a luchador who is the leader of the luchadors, and he's a pro wrestler terminology equipping machine because he's a luchador. Matt, on the other hand, is a British hacker who is the leader of the Deckers. He's asked to drain the bank account of the Saints. The boss walks up to an ATM and tries to withdraw one million dollars. What? Uh, okay, first of all, trying to take out any amount of money after walking through what is basically the methadone mile is quite stupid. But more importantly, asking for a million dollars from an ATM is downright crazy. Why, why couldn't they just have the boss check her balance? The body of Mr. Gat will be a message for all who oppose the syndicate. Huh. Body of Mr. Gat. So he's definitely dead, right? Since we're here in a new city with little to no money, weapons, or even a place to sleep, the boss decides to raid a military base. Cool. Wait a minute, there's a cop stuck in a trunk of my car. Okay, so anyways, we clear out the army of guards with the help of Shandi and nobody else with the majority of our time there. Pierce finally shows up with the rest of the saints and we carry the artillery all the way to Shandi's ex-boyfriend's apartment. Hardy, har, har. By the way, I'm glad we're still operating by the cops and robbers rule. Like, yeah, we took your stuff, but we made it back to the safe house, so you can't chase us anymore. Once we get situated, we meet up with Pierce at the park. It's basically a showcase of the customization in this game. After changing the boss's clothes, a new enemy approaches approaches. This thing is called a brood. He takes a lot of shots and will throw objects at you. Gee, I remember when we were able to pick up objects and throw them. In the next mission, Pierce tells us that the Morningstar owns a large building that would be great for an HQ. According to all of my friends that have played this game, and myself really, this is the most memorable mission in this entire game. The funniest part about it is that it's only because of the song choice. Hey, good morning, Kanye. I guarantee you, if we skydived into the party with royalty-free music in the background, then nobody would care. It's seriously just your run-of-the-mill list of objectives. I was more interested in the Saints member's choice of outfit. This man's is wearing Tim's, Bruh. denim shorts, and a leather jacket with the Bruh. fur. Bruh. This has to be the craziest nigga known to man. After disarming a bomb that was in the building for whatever reason, the Saints now have an HQ in Stillport. Okay, quick side note, I always punch the window to get outside, am I the only person who does that? Anyways, we have reached the point of the game where we are handed our first set of filler missions. Instead of completing a list of unique objectives, you get an activity level. I know what you're gonna say, it's only been a handful of missions and now we have to do recycled busy work. At least they only give out two at most before we get a real mission. In this case, the 
the first one is a new activity, Guardian Angel. The only thing I have to say about this activity is that for some reason we have to hang off the side of a building during the sniping section. Kinda weird, but whatever. The next filler arc is trafficking, but now you're no longer escorting your heroin dealer friend to a drug deal. Now you're doing merch deals or something. While Pierce was driving the car, I noticed something that I found unintentionally hilarious. When shooting directly from behind in the vehicle, the character will poke his or her head out and point the gun 45 degrees away from the intended target. I'm not sure why the game devs didn't just have them shoot through the back window. There's no way this off angle shit was the easier option. The next real mission from Pierce is another showcase of the things that you could do in Steelport. Just like in the last game, you can buy stores, including Planet Saints clothing, which is weird because I thought we already owned those. It has our gang name in it, never mind. You can also buy properties, which are buildings that you can't enter. In terms of conflict, there's gang operations, where a bunch of enemies are chilling in one spot, and sex dolls. You can also collect sex dolls for money. LMFAO. You would think that we'd be done with these filler arcs for now at the very least, right? Nope, we got two more. Jeez, it's like watching Bleach. This time we have mayhem, but instead of running around blowing up fences, you're driving a tank. The next one is Professor Genki's Super Ethical Reality Climax. Despite the dumb name, this is by a long shot the best new activity in this game. It's basically an obstacle course with guns. You start off with a pistol, but you'll get better weapons along the way, and your health doesn't regenerate like in the open world. It's difficult enough to keep you on your toes, and yet it's short enough so it doesn't overstay its welcome. Still though, I don't know about you guys, but I prefer when my activities are optional. And now we can finally get back to the main story. Wait, this is a stronghold mission. Okay, well the only part worth mentioning is a new variation of the brute. Oh, and Shandy's being aggressive because Gat's death seriously affected her or something. You don't think the back's guarded? There's like two punks. What about the inside, motherfucker? Put in your tampons and let's do this. Another example of this is when the gang prepares to take out Lauren. Pierce tries to baby her again, to no avail of course. God, I have a lot to say about Shandy in this game, but I'll hold it till after the story is finished. We travel to the Syndicate Tower and fight a wave of Morningstar enemies. Turns out that the Brutes are actually clones. I'm assuming this was everybody's first guess. Shandy, Pierce, and the boss meet Oleg. He's the guy who the Syndicate used to create Brutes. Gee, I wonder if they're gonna explore his backstory. What did you do before you were a... Uh glorified pincushion? I think it's best for our friendship, I never elaborate. Okay, never mind. At least he's on our side. Oleg leads us to Loren, and the trio take turns on whiffing shots at him. I take it that this is a callback to Saints Row 1, or it could be an excuse to hop on this ball thingy so we can catch up to him. Seriously, what is this, and why does it have bars on the bottom of it? One web search later. Oh, so this is a tune mass damper. Okay, wow, I'm really surprised by the attention to detail here. Anyways, the boss rides the ball all the way down a building that is damn near 1,000 meters high, by the way. How is the boss gonna survive that fall? Will she parachute off or something? Well then, how durable is the boss during a cutscene? This demon spawn can get launched out of a car going at top speed and get up like nothing's happened, survive an explosion from kissing distance, and base jump without a parachute apparently. And don't you give me that the ball was stopped halfway through bullshit, the boss would have reached terminal velocity on either of the falls. I definitely think that there is a way to incorporate this ball thingy into a cutscene without making it look this stupid, but I'm just taking a piss here, kinda. The real issue is that they killed off Philippe Loren in the first part of the story, and they did it in a way that that made it seem a little unintentional. I know the game is implying that the boss meant to crush him with a Bakugan, at least I think so, but it definitely looked like she just got lucky, and this is the guy who got Gat killed. I would have imagined something similar to Kazuyo's death in Saints Row 2, but either way, Philippe is dead. We'll remember him for his love of, uh... Okay, he was just a one-dimensional villain. Say the line, Jason. They dropped the ball on this one. <laughs> We're given the option to either keep the building or blow it up. Saints Row 3 will give you choices to make throughout the game with rewards depending on which one you'll pick. Now, I really wanted to melt some steel beams as a callback to our random acts of terrorism throughout the games. But I had completely forgotten about that until now. And I'm already halfway through editing. So. After driving the bomb somewhere, never to be seen again, well, how about I just play this cutscene in its entirety because it was quite confusing to me during the first time I played this game. When I left Stillwater for the Senate, I vowed never to forget my hometown roots. My husband gave his life defending Stillwater from gang violence. It is my greatest privilege to honor him with this bridge. 
spot boys Whoever this crew is, they flow pretty damn good. They're Killbane's thugs. Kill who? He's the Syndicate's attack dog. What he did to Johnny's funeral, that's over the fucking limit. He doesn't care about the rules of engagement. Uh, no rules? I can work with that. You're not ready to fight the Syndicate. Watch us. Just relax, Shandy. All right, big man, what do you got? There are others who hate the Syndicate as much as you do. I will take you to them. Between Kilbane being able to aim an RPG with both eyes open and the bridge breaking apart when it feels like it, I think the latter is way more hilarious. But those are relatively small issues. The real problem is the storytelling that this game is trying to do. It genuinely seems like they forgot to add the rest of the cutscene to make the final product cohesive. In case you couldn't figure out what's going on here, according to the wiki, the saints are going back to Stillwater to bury Gat. If you chose to destroy the tower, the boss will say just that. Kinda wish that was said in both options, but whatever. Gat's body is placed into a hearse because he's really dead. Are you getting sick of this joke? Don't care, I feel the need to hammer this into your head because of what's going to happen in the next game. The gang make their way back to Stillwater by using a bridge that we will never see again. It was named after the fat guy from the first game, not to be confused with the fat guy from Saints Row 2. Then the attack happens and Shandi is like, what he did to Johnny's funeral is over the limit. I'm assuming they had the first part of the funeral at Steelport and then they hauled ass all the way to Stillwater. I say assuming because we don't have much to work with. If the Volition Boys would have added a cutscene where the Saints are paying their respects to Johnny Gat before they get on the bridge, it would make this part of the story more fleshed out. Also, it would have a higher chance in making the player hate the Syndicate, and above all, it would be a proper send-off for one of the best characters in the game. Instead, we get plopped in the middle of this fuckery. By the way, since he's in that hearse, homie's body is just chilling at the bottom of the ocean, and they just left it there. Holy cannoli, that is disrespectful. No, seriously, the Three Musketeers teleport to the dock to find three new lieutenants, so I guess it's time to move on then. Our first recruit is Kinsey. She's a hacker who previously worked for the FBI, but was fired after she was framed to look like she was leaking secrets to foreign entities and moonlighting as a dominatrix. I thought that that would result in a promotion with these alphabet agencies. You think the FBI has standards? They ran a to fight after capturing the website owner. She's currently tied up on a barge by the Deckers. After cleaning house, she tells us that another recruit named Zemos is being kept in a BDSM club. When we reach him, more Morningstar members show up, and instead of shooting them like we did before the cutscene, we hop on the pony cart and drive away. Oh, and Zemos is pulling the cart while wearing a gimp suit. I, I felt that that needed to be highlighted. I think it works that way. Kinsey hits our line to tell us that another potential ally named Angel de la Muerte is fighting the luchadors right now as you speak. Funny how all three of these guys were in trouble with the three still poor gangs. Maybe not funny, but it's definitely something. After we take care of the lucha bros, Angel runs back into his casino home. I don't think we were supposed to catch up to him this quickly. And I don't know who the hell that guy is. I don't think he's with the luchadors. Well, he's dressed as a luchador, but he's not with the luchador gang. I totally wish these guys had a different name. Now that we're 
we're making progress in the story, the game decides to hit us with more filler arcs. Zemos, Kenzie, and Angel will give you a couple of activities, but I'm just gonna ignore them for the most part and focus on the real missions. Starting with Zemos, once we get his shit over with, we call Shandi, and she tells us that Pierce is throwing a party at the HQ. Shandi is mad because, well, that's her default emotion at this point. It turns out that the hoes that Zemos brought over are actually ho assassins. This plan was concocted by the twins. It was unsuccessful. Kilbane hated that idea and snapped Kiki's neck out of anger. I'm guessing this was done to make Kilbane look like an asshole, but I'm on his side to be honest. How do you come up with such a terrible and presumably expensive plan, then get pissy when confronted and call him by his shoot name? You? Honestly, she was just asking for it. After another filler mission, the boss gives Zemos a call and asks if there's another way to mess with the Morningstar. The wife of the fat guy with the bridge, her name is Monica Hughes by the way, she's on TV pushing for Stag to come to Steelport. More on that later. Zemos informs us that the Morningstar is holding a booty auction and we can crash it. Um, one, one question, why are we naked? I know Zemos' plan was to sell the boss and then later infiltrate, but why was all that even necessary? It's not like the option of going in guns blazing from the jump was shot down because of reasons. The boss is just running around in her birthday suit after presumably getting her cheeks taken because it's funny. Alright then. And don't even get me started on the fact that you have access to all your weapons despite having nowhere to store them. That shit could fly outside of a mission, but here it seems like a missed opportunity to make this harder by having weapon restrictions. I'm starting to think that the guys at Volition are prioritizing the lulls instead of the logic, and it's really biting them in the ass. Believe me, it's possible to have a story that is both funny and somewhat sensical. Anyways, Viola turns face by telling us about a shipment of women coming to Stillport. The game gives us another choice to make, but it doesn't really matter story-wise. We meet up with her at the park to discuss business. Johnny's dead because of you. Johnny's dead because he thought he could do everything on his own. So what's in it for you? Why did the boss just immediately capitulate? She's like, hmm, touche. Did Volition have beef with Daniel Day Kim or something? Cause Gat is eating bitch left and right. Their conversation was interrupted by STAG. STAG stands for Special Tactical Anti-Gang Unit. They're basically the military with futuristic weapons. And after playing another game of cops and robbers, we're introduced to the two key members, Kia and Cyrus Temple. Kia is a subordinate, nothing more, nothing less. Cyrus is a leader who previously looked like Cholo Mike Pence before the rematch. The Saints decide to mess with Stag by hijacking their VTOLs and kidnapping Josh Burke because he's VIP or something. We have a choice to either give Josh back to Stag or have him join the Saints. I chose the latter option, it also doesn't really matter in the long run anyway. You might be wondering, where the hell are the Syndicate? Well, they're completely separate from the Stag arc until the last mission. Kinda weird considering anti-gang unit is in their name, but whatever. After jumping off our building, we set our sights on the Syndicate. The boss is Shondi meet Kenzie at the restaurant. She shows us a fake video of the Saints trio getting busy in front of the fat guy bridge. As you can see, we're being framed by Kilbane as domestic terrorists. Which yeah, we are. We blew up a recording studio twice because Vice Kings and burnt down a neighborhood because of some persistent Jamaicans. We go on a wild goose chase until we finally catch up to Kilbane. Shondi lines up her shot, but Matt Miller comes in with a save. I guess we're taking out the Deckers. Alright. Kenzie tells us that we need a virtual reality machine in order to stop Matt and his crew. After getting all the stuff, we enter the VR world. Hilarity ensues. First we spawn as a toilet, then we digivolve into a sex doll. Hilarious. There is also an interactive fiction and a tank minigame. Fast forward to the boss fight, and Matt shows up as a fire-breathing, sword-wielding humanoid dragon. The battle became a cakewalk once he copied his character model. And as if things couldn't get any easier, we're given quick time events. Holy shit, remember quick time events? Thank a lot that was left in the past. When Matt is defeated, he begs the boss to spare him in exchange for a discount on either weapons or cars. I don't know who in their right mind would choose to have 25% off vehicles, I mean, you can't even race cars anymore. But more importantly, seeing the boss spare a gang leader feels so damn disappointing. Back in Saints Row 2, if you even caused the boss a minor inconvenience, you'd be dead. You wanna know what happened to the last guy named Matt who got in her way? The ending cutscene shows Kilbane expressing his disappointment towards Matt about him leaving the city. And if you thought that Kilbane was going to be the guy who killed the worst dressed teenager in Stillport, you'd be wrong. I'm not sure why he decided not to, but whatever. Back on the stack side, you know how Shandi is all aggressive as shit, being fueled by nothing but anger, constantly proving that she's more than capable of defending herself? Well, guess what happens to her? Oh, no, 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 fuck! Shandi? <laughs> Yeah, she gets her dumbass kidnapped. Throw all that boss bitch shit out the window because we gotta save her again. 
For the second time, the boss comes up with the bright idea of disguising herself as Cyrus by going to a plastic surgeon, and then use Pierce and Viola as prisoners. Now before you say anything about the whole Cyrus getup, it is possible to change your entire appearance by going to the Image as Design store, so it checks out. This is a horrible idea. Just do it already. Look, you may be cool with wearing handcuffs, but this motherfucker ain't down with that. What's that supposed to mean? Well, you know, you ran a prostitution ring. So clearly I'm into kink. You carry a gun. Does that mean you like to be shot? What the, what the fuck? That is a terrible rebuttal. As if there's a gun owner out there who likes to get shot. On the other hand, there's a high chance that a pimp would be into some weird shit. Whoever wrote this line needs to stop smoking crack. The disguise worked, until it didn't, and after we saved Shandi and the others, Stag locks down the entire city. In other words, they will shoot you on sight, which should have been the plan in the first place. It doesn't stop us from discussing how to take care of Kilbane. Instead of emptying a mag in his dome, like the boss suggests, Viola and Angel recommend that we challenge him to a wrestling match at Murder Brawl 31, so we can unmask him. The game tries to justify why they went this route, but it's useless. To be honest, Kilbane is kinda terrible as an antagonist. He's fighting for screen time against Stag and he's losing. Speaking of which, guess what mission we're doing next? Kinsey tells us that there's a Stag plane en route to Steelport. Surely we can't take that level of disrespect. be fucking kidding me this bitch is basically wolverine the boss obtains a new gun called the sonic boom oh yeah i almost forgot some missions will give you special weapons to use the military raid had the predator missile decker's vr world had the mega buster and here we have the short range vaporizer they're okay i guess after an a-team reference the boss lands her tank on arapice arapice apache island then zombies emerge because the chemical waste was that powerful Moving on, Viola sets up a meeting with the mayor over the incident, and it turns out it's Burt Reynolds. Okay, all the criticism I have for this game so far is still valid, but I fucking love Burt Reynolds, so it almost makes up for it. For some reason, the game makes you decide between saving the zombie material for yourself or helping the mayor. You already know what I chose, I don't give a shit about zombie homies. Back to the syndicate, after helping Angel get his mask back, he joins us in a fight against Kilbane at Murder Brawl. In this mission, we can't use firearms, only hands. Oh, and urinals, tiki torches, and a whole chainsaw. Which kind of reminds me of Fight Club from Saints Row 2. Kind of makes me wish there was a pro wrestling minigame here. Although it got a little repetitive towards the boss versus Killbane stage. You just hit him with foreign objects and complete some godforsaken quick time events. We're given a choice to either unmask Killbane or let him go. If you chose the latter, you get the Apocophis. I don't feel like getting footage of that weapon in action, but just imagine a sonic boom, but as a melee weapon. Not really worth it. <laughs> Think the remaster just ruined that joke. Kilbane, it's just a match. It's my fucking reputation. This is my city. I am its Caesar. And I get to fiddle while it burns. So what's Kilbane going to do next? What's his big final plan to take care of the Saints? Well, did you guess getting the fuck up out of Steelport? If so, then you are correct. I'm not even joking. In the final mission, we get into a triple threat fight with the Luchadors and Stag. In the middle of all this, Kilbane tries to pull a Dex. I swear, between this and the Johnny Gat funeral, I'm starting to think that Volition just straight up ran out of production time. Before we can drive over and give him that Angela Lopez treatment, Kia calls and tells us that she's gonna blow up a monument with Shondi on it. And now now we have one final choice to make, save Shandi or kill Kilbane. This is a hard decision to make, and it's because on one hand, you have a character who acts nothing like she used to for no reason, and on the other hand, you have the most forgettable antagonist in the entire series, despite Volition's intentions. It's really hard to pick one over the other, is what I would say if Burt Reynolds wasn't also stuck on that monument, so... Once we knock the bombs out into the ocean, we encounter Kia, who's holding Shandi hostage, just like the veteran child did. 
wait, this is basically a copy and paste of that fight. I do want to comment on how lazy this is, but I'm way more focused on the fact that this is the third time we have to save Shandi, which is incredible considering that we only had to save her once in Saints Row 2. What was the point of turning her into an aggressive sassy woman if she ends up being a damsel in distress on three separate occasions? Jesus, after you kill Kia, Monica calls off Stag, and the Saints leave to film Gangsters in Space. For whatever reason, this movie has an actor portraying Johnny Gad. It's not explicitly said, but that's the assumption. Um, am I the only person who finds this weird? There's no way Shandi would have been okay with that. And that's the good ending. The bad ending, on the other hand, has some positives, despite Burt Reynolds dying. It starts with Angel taking a boss to the airport, and wait, this is way too similar to the final Cronalis mission. When I named out Angela Lopez, I didn't realize that this was just a complete rehash until now. Wait, what in a nitpick? Kilbane's face is still messed up, but Angel has seemingly recovered from his broken leg. Get your shit together, Volition. So the boss fights Kilbane. Wait, I'm sorry. She quick time events him and snaps his neck. The bomb goes off, killing Shandi, Burt Reynolds, and Viola. The remaining Saints meet up at a bar. Wait, who invited the Decker? Doesn't matter. A big ass airship named the Data List shows up and bombs the shit out of Steelport. I don't understand the logic here. The Saints blew up a monument, so now we can retaliate by leveling the entire city. I mean, maybe if this was the Middle East, it'd make more sense. After killing Cyrus, the boss goes on channel 6 to threaten Monica Hughes. Okay, when I said that this ending has some positives, I only meant this one. This is the only time where the boss is acting like, well, the boss. And that's it for the main story. Wow, having to go through it for this video really made me notice how terrible it was. Now just like the last game, we got some DLC to deal with, but unlike Saints Row 2, the endings are nearly as awful. No need for a title card though, I'm currently at a point where I just want to get to the conclusion as fast as I can so I can go back into hibernation. The Gangsters in Space story has the boss participate in the Gangsters in Space film, not to be mistaken with the Gangsters in Space film that we just did because that's completely separate from this, but not really, I, I don't know slash so care. The only thing I have to say about this DLC DLC is that in one of the missions, we have to take out an alien brew. They reuse the execution, Desert Eagle and all, instead of the alien pistols. Okay, moving on. The Genki DLC. It's just a handful of activities. Cool, moving on once again to Trouble with Clones. This story involves the boss and Pierce going on a quest to find and bring in a clone of Johnny Gad. I'm gonna skip over the Pierce and Drag, I don't even feel like explaining it. When we show up to the nerd's house, my goodness, somebody didn't want to make an actual cutscene. When the boss wakes up, she finds out that the nerd gave her superpowers. It's a little fun, but I got bored of it after a couple of minutes. I sure hope that it won't become the main game mechanic in Saints Row 4. Foreshadow. Verb be a warning or indication of I'm not sure why, but the powers wear off and the last half of the mission is a helicopter shooter section. Seems kind of odd, but okay. What would I rate the DLC pack? Or whatever out of 10. Let's move on to the critique. I'm gonna get the positives out the way because it's truly a short list. In terms of gameplay, I like the reworked combat system. For example, when you run towards an enemy and press the attack button, you'll do a random wrestling move. It's an effective way to incapacitate enemies, although the animations got a little stale after a while, but I've played this game on and off since 2011, so it's fine. And there's also takedowns. I would put that in the positive column, but I absolutely despise quick time events. When it comes to vehicles, you can enter them by using the Bodukan. It's a stupid name, but it makes carjackings a hundred times easier. No need to hop on top and teleport inside, and they even created new regular hijacking animations just for the hell of it. The respect system was changed completely, now it's a leveling system. I don't hate it, so I'll put it over on a positive side also. As for the positives I have for the story, um Besides Burt Reynolds, I got nothing, so let's move on to the negatives. Starting with the story, it is probably one of the worst that I've ever played in my life in terms of sequels. Choosing to prioritize wackiness was a bad decision because the narrative was sacrificed for a bunch of shitty jokes. In Saints Row 2, there was a more serious tone, but there was also comedic moments and it never ruined the overall story. One example of this is the mission where Gat gets stabbed. When we arrive at the hospital, we inform Pierce that Gat's at a commission. He responds, That mean I get a promotion? Don't get too excited. Excited, asshole. This is how it should be utilized. The comedy is working with the story, not overtaking it. Instead, we get missions where we ride around in a gimp chariot, or that time we drove around with a tiger in the backseat, and also that time when we woke up and ran around butt naked, which has to be the dumbest one because, like I said before, there is no reason to be quote unquote naked. If you're going to have us do goofy shit, at least have a good reason as to why we're doing it. But that's not the only major issue with the story. Actually, there's a shitload, but the treatment of Johnny Gat is almost as egregious as a change in tone. You might be wondering, why would they clap the most loved character 
character in the series? Well, according to a podcast that Scott Phillips did, holy shit, it's 56 minutes long. Okay, give me a moment. So sure. early on, uh, it seems like Johnny Gat is dead. But of course, I know, no, he's not really dead. You didn't see him die. The airplane went down. That's that's classic movie language for he's going to come back later. <laughs> Uh, was that intentional all along? Were you guys like wanting to hedge your bets and maybe bring him back? Or did you know early on you were going to actually decisively kill Johnny Gat? Uh, I think it was pretty early on that we, we knew we wanted to create a big, uh, a big moment for the player to want to hate uh, Philippe and the syndicate. Hmm. And, you know, kind of the, the, the biggest character by far in, you know, in Saints Row mythology and discussion is, is Johnny Gat. And so it was a pretty, a pretty quick uh, choice of Gat, but then not a very easy uh, sale. Like I, I, I still go back and forth about it. I, I'm not sure how I feel about having done it. Uh, I think it was a good choice to to kind of drive home that the syndicate, uh, you know, they're your threat and you need to kill them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, you know, the team. The team are fans of, of the franchise, and you know they like the story. They like Johnny Gat as a character, and so the team even was kind of like, "Why are we doing this? You know, what 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 sense does it make to kill Johnny Gat?" So they did it to get the player to hate the syndicate more, which is fine. But how about you have some balls and make his death on screen? Phillips did just confirm that he's dead, and it's even the case by Saints Row logic. If you didn't know, finishing the final mission will reward you with Zombie Gat. This is a tradition. In Saints Row 1, when Lynn died, you were able to unlock Zombie Lynn by calling some voodoo business. Same thing with Carlos in Saints Row 2. His character model gave me nightmares when I was younger. I thought I should share that. So the rule is, if you're available as a zombie ally, then you are dead. Sounds really simple, right? All I can say is wait for that Saints Row 4 video. But I digress. If you wanted to get the player to hate the syndicate, then don't kill Gat off screen. Instead of being angry, I was more confused. When I first saw the cutscene, I kept asking myself, did he really go out like that? And when Zombie Gat was unlocked, I was like, huh, he really is gone. What a bummer, I guess. Poor execution all around. Ty's death from Gears of War is a much better example of what they were trying to do. If you're not familiar with the Gears of War franchise, don't worry, I got you. Ty was a soldier who helped you from time to time. The first two games built him up as a badass. Sounds familiar, right? In Gears of War 2, he gets captured and imprisoned by enemies. When we find him, he looks like... Well, he looks like that. And when Marcus hands him a shotgun, Ty says, Suicide is badass! And ends his life. As a player, you're probably thinking, holy shit, if the Locusts can make Ty tap out, then they're definitely a serious threat. And I think I hate them even more now. It gives you motivation to go after the antagonist, something that Saints Row 3 lacked. Something else to think about here. Killing off the most popular character in a game or movie or whatever medium means that you have to fill that void with other characters. And Saints Row 3 failed to do that. How about we go down the list? Let's get Shandi out the way first. The best way to describe it is that this is not Shandi. She has the same name as a stoner, but that's about it. In Saints Row 2, she was the stereotypical laid back pothead, but now she acts like she has a metaphorical stick up her ass. And that's before Gat's death. The biggest problem here is that there's no explanation for the transition whatsoever. She's practically a new character. Did they not have enough time to have a storyline Line where a bald Shandi is distancing herself from the devil's lettuce to focus on being a lieutenant. I say bald because she would have missed the entirety of Saints Row 3 if she had decided to straighten out her dreads. The other problem is that she cares so much about Johnny out of nowhere. I'm about 95% sure that prior to this game, Gat has said one thing to her. So what do we do now? We listen. Granted, they do have a couple of conversations before he kicks the bucket, but it's not nearly enough for her to go on a rampage. And how about that rampage? Not only did she play a small role in killing Philippe, but she didn't even get a chance to revenge all over Kilbane. There's just something hilarious about the game showing us that she's more serious and capable, but then we have to save her about three times. Even if Volition meant to do that, it's still a smooth brain idea because I don't know a single person who likes this version of Shandi. Pierce is actually okay in this game, but he's a mid-carter so you can't really do much with them besides making jokes at his expense. As for the new allies, yeah, I know, only three of them are returning characters. Kinsey is probably the best one out of the batch, and that's not saying much. She plays her role well as an oracle. Wait, holy shit, she looks just like her. I guess her narrative goal was to outbest Matt, but besides that, she's just a hacker girl. Although his attire and autotune makes him stand out, there's not that much to Zemos. It's a screen time issue since he is legit nowhere to be found after Viola joins the Saints, which is weird because they have 
have history. She's the reason why we found him with a horsetail stuck up his ass. Speaking of Viola, well, she's forgettable. So forgettable, in fact, that out of all the characters in this game, she would be the easiest to erase from the story. Both of the times that she's helped us, it's been with problems that we could have fixed ourselves. The syndicate has a shipment of women coming in. It's not like that matters anyways. They have no leader. And with or without the mayor's input, Apache Island is just that, an island. The bridges were already raised when Stag got sick of our shit. By the time we got there, there were no survivors. The problem solved itself. She's just a corporate shandy, somebody who's there to make sassier marks, and we already have Kinsey also filling that role. Angel is better by a tiny margin since he trains the boss for a fight with the Lucha House Party. It's not much, but it's something. Character-wise, he only exists to be the opposite of Kilbane, but he disappears for some reason during the final fight. I guess he was just watching it all happen off screen. And with Oleg, the game legit tells you that we're not going to learn more about him. So he's just an intelligent brute, like a Dr. Hank or a Winston. So these were the guys that were supposed to replace Johnny. Apparently it's the hardest task known to man. Or it could be the fact that Volition got lucky with the first two games. They also failed to make the antagonist worth your time. All of that quote unquote effort to make the player hate the syndicate and it went nowhere. Loren, the twins, Matt, and Kilbane are all terrible and it doesn't help that they're fighting against Stag for screen time. It's like Spider-Man 3 all over again. And there's not much I can say about Kia and Cyrus. They're not worth another sentence in the script. That leaves us with the boss. From Psychopath to whatever the hell this is. The worst part about this is the amount of times she's been bitched by her own subordinates. There seems to be a distinct lack of hierarchy which makes her look super weak. From Zemo's forcing her to get drugged and naked to Shandy just well, being Shandy. But to be honest, the boss is a reflection of the story, meaning that if the story is bad, the player will not be the saving grace. Now, before I move on to the stuff outside the story, I want to talk about Dex for a bit. In Sancho 3, he's completely absent. According to an interview with Destructoid that I don't feel like finding, Dex was left out because he was going to be in a spinoff game. But when the game got canceled, he was still left on the cutting room floor because they didn't want to alienate the new players who haven't played the first and or the second game. Okay, if they actually said that, then this has to be the dumbest excuse I've ever heard in my life. Because first of all, Troy can't bail you out of this one. I vowed never to forget my hometown roots. My husband gave his life defending Stillwater from gang violence. Boss, I'm surprised you came. None of my crew is getting killed. Really? Lynn? Carlos, Aisha. Second of all, it's the third installment of the series. There's going to be some shit that new players won't fully understand without playing the other games. You should be able to get the gist, however. I'm going to use Gears of War as an example again. Did you know that Gears 2 was my introduction to the series? And I still knew what was going on despite that. It's not like you're making Star Trek, your story isn't that intricate. Do you know how easy it is to have Dex as the main antagonist? Watch this. Oh no. Dex killed Johnny Gat. Who the hell is Dex? He was the original member of the Saints, but he dropped his flags once his ego got the best of him. He also tried to kill the boss on two separate occasions. Oh. And voila, don't give me that look. It's not like Saints Rose above doing an exposition dump when they started their game with one. It's way better than what we got instead, but let's move on. Steelport has to be the ugliest city ever, in terms of video games. How do we go from Stillwater to this? It feels like I'm walking around in Detroit with a coat of depression gray splattered all over. Besides the downtown area, there's not a lot of places that catch your eye. As for the side quests, with the exception of Genki's Obstacle Course and Guardian Angel, the rest are just returning activities and or rehashes. There's no crowd control, no fight club, no septic avenger, no fuzz, and no racing, which I hate the most because it was an opportunity to give you more of a reason to collect cars. You don't even get those little cutscenes with the side characters since these activities are given to you by the Third Street Saints members and also because they're lazy. The Genki DLC adds a couple more, but it's not enough. Extremely underwhelming. And the rest of the issues I have with this game can be simply described as lack of attention to detail. I'm just gonna list the ones that I found in no particular order. I'm really tired, okay? The tattoos look terrible. The gun store clerk looks like a random NPC. The grenade throwing animation looks weird. Can't turn off dual wielding once you unlock it. Like I mentioned beforehand, the shooting in a vehicle animation looks awful. The clothing store is neutered and the DLC items aren't put into their own section. The car we had to upgrade near the beginning has a coupe decal when it's a sedan. The three new cribs you obtain from the stronghold missions all look the same and you can't change the interior. It would have been fine if they had their own different styles, which they had before you took them over. And 
And finally, despite taking over the Syndicate Tower, you can't do anything with it. You can't even go back inside once the mission is over. Matter of fact, you can't re-enter a lot of buildings in general. Remember when we kidnapped Josh at the police station? I'm about 90% sure you can't even get into the main lobby, let alone that floor. Meanwhile, there were only two missions that involved the prison in Saints Row 2, and yet there's so much shit that you can do when you travel back. Apparently, the Syndicate Tower was going to be a crib along with the Morningstar gun store, but they decided not to because fuck you, I guess. No such thing as too many cribs. Listen, if this game was called Happy Shooter Fun Time instead of Saints Row 3, I probably would have been less harsh. It's not though, and Volition has already shown that they can improve on what they have. But oh boy did they shit the bed this time. Do not buy this game, stick to Saints Row 2, Happy New Year.